Hello, Philip. Hi. <laughs> okay, so um, I want to do an interview with you today to bring your work to a wider audience, to people who have perhaps not heard of you. So for some people, you're a familiar face, but for those who don't know you and who you are, like, so who are you and what do you do? So um, I'm here in Devon and I've been uh, here teaching at Schumacher College uh, for the last uh, 10 years. And um, during that time, a, a lot has changed in the world. That uh, when I started at Schumacher College, there was a very clear kind of ecological movement. There were very clear aims to it, a very clear structure. And um, I was glad to be part of that as it raised awareness. And gradually, The Guardian started talking about climate change on its front page. Uh, many of the issues that was kind of under the surface of the economy started um, bubbling up into people's awareness and people's conversations. Um, and that was a very clear phase. But this last phase of the last few years has been very different. That we've had Brexit and Trump and this kind of um, chaotic behaviour in many systems that have stopped kind of going from A to B in a clear way, but have started being buffeted by many forces, many relationships, and become incomprehensible to many people. And in that, my work has kind of changed into seeing that uh, what is needed has to happen more at a personal level. It's more, how do you find the coherence within yourself when everything around you is kind of blurred and fuzzy and disorientating. So, so you don't see yourself as a lecturer necessarily anymore? You, you see yourself more as an emissary of change or something? Is that what you're getting at? Yes, so um, from, I really I've moved from the classroom into projects. Um, so doing a lot of work with water, in, with Indian communities, and seeing what happens when you change your landscape, what happens in the hearts of people. And how if the heart of the pe person isn't involved, then nothing changes. So when you say change your landscape, what, what kind of changes what are you talking about? Uh, so that's very arid landscapes in Rajasthan. And yeah, the water's getting less and less. So the water table uh, is, is dropping right down and becoming unreachable to many worlds. But restoring these traditional structures where you hold the water in the landscape and you involve the community, so they really own the structures that you build and look after them. And in, in a few years, the whole area becomes green because you hold the monsoon rain and that is able to nourish the, the, the fields and also raise the water table. So rivers that have stopped running can actually run again. And you realize that instead of passively waiting for climate change and looking for uh, when are we going to hit the two degree mark, that actually everything's possible. We can change everything according to our attitude. Okay. So it's moved from trying to kind of understand a problem in its global terms to kind of how do you motivate solutions that are there? Well, this is something we absolutely need because we're living on a planet that has many, many problems and too few solutions, or at least the uh, solutions that actually work. And um, so, you know, m my interest in you and your work and, the, you know, the, the reason for you know, being here and interviewing you today stems from this kind of spiritual and kind of ecological emergency we find ourselves in as a species. And, uh, you know, we live in a world that measures nature's value in a purely economic sense. Even though it's the th the only thing that keeps us alive, we 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 have no care for it at all. We're you know in a race to destroy it, and so you know we live in this disjointed, broken, completely on the wrong track kind of society, and we're deeply in need of change. And yet, what we see is business as usual. But business as usual is no longer an option. Something has to change. And so so you know, do you, do you see the world that way? And if so. You know, why, is, why do you think human society is so broken? What, what, what's the cause of this problem? Mm. No, I think that um, there are kind of two attitudes uh, that you can have in relation to the world. One is uh, to be open to the world mm. and um, yet yeah, to kind of surrender to something bigger than yourself and 
n not to force things into immediate solutions, but try to open things out. So you're generous, you're trusting, uh, you're allowing of, of what's around you, and uh, y y you're, you're wanting, you're collaborative, you're wanting to find something uh, meaningful and integral with other people and the work you do. And uh, it, alongside that, I'd say, there's this kind of uh, mean attitude. And this meanness uh, wants to instead bring back, it wants to protect, it wants to say, this is who I am, and I'm, you know, I'm going to hold this territory. And, uh, yeah, I want things to work in my way. And so in, in order for that to happen, I'm going to um, distrust what's outside me. You know, I'm not going to be loyal to others. I'm going to, yeah, to just keep going with what is good for me and what I contend. And these two attitudes are necessary in the world. If everything was, you know, open and loving, nothing would work including nature it, it you know you have to have that uh, ability to withdraw into your own gathering of energy and getting things to work but so so okay with this give and take kind of two yeah. attitudes that, that exist it seems that the take is the one that's taken over right now yeah you know we're in a world of take uh, why do you think that is or why do you think we're in that way of doing things well i think in a way taking is simpler it's a kind of shortcut because you can offer, you can, you know, if you say to somebody you'll be rich tomorrow, they'll be, they'll, they'll believe you. If you say you, you, you'll be prosperous in 40 years and your children will be prosperous, they probably won't be patient for that. And, and probably I'd say that what's gradually happened is that we've taken that meanness and we've kind of turned it into a sort of metaphysics. We've turned it into a philosophy that living for the short term, not believing in God, uh, distrusting your neighbour, is 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 a kind of you know a cool way of life, and the people who you know do it really coolly come out as victorious with lots of money. And so, instead of having it as as an attitude to life, that of course sometimes you need that kind of. Um, Way you know you need that way of engaging with the world. It's become as as if that can be the dominant thing. You don't need anything else. That the world can run on those tracks. And yeah, now we've got to a point where it's obvious the world can't run on those tracks. Well, yeah, I read your book. Um, the, the was it Time, Light, and the Dice of Creation. Yeah. And um, and in, in it you seem to be pointing the finger. Um, you know, some of the issues we have today at the kind of reductionist, um, you know, scientific philosophy, which has taken over the world, which I guess reductionist would be the opposite of holistic. Is, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, you know, this, this philosophy assumes everything's separated. Everything that we understand, we understand by separating them into our own little bits. So, so uh, is, that, is that right? Do you think? Is that, is that the problem? Is it, is it simply the reductionist mindset that's, uh, that's, the cause of the problems and you know if, if so why, why is reducing things and separating them necessarily bad well I think you know th this meanness and this openness they go with kind of destruction and creation yeah. that um, our way of if you want to break things down to see how they work in a way it involves killing them you have to destroy like you're taught in a biology class you have to kill the ame you know the what you're studying to see all the organs of it and uh, and of course that is a valid way of engaging with the world which is to try to yeah, find the mechanism behind it and to try to yeah, take out the livingness of the world and to see at its most elementary how does this connect to this connect to this uh, and for that to work and of course, you know, a lot of our society runs on technology, which has happened through that method. But um, I think the short-sightedness 
uh, is not that reductionism isn't true and isn't a way of engaging with the world, but it's eclipsing another way of engaging with the world, which is openness and, and you could say, love or embracing the aliveness of things, not to um, destroy them by putting them into parts, but to try to find their meaning and what's their meaning in relation to a greater whole. So, um, so like uh, Goethe, who was a scientist as well as an artist, would not take the, the flower into his laboratory, but he tried to he, he'd meticulously look at the plant and then he tried to, in his imagination, uh, recreate the journey the plant was making from seed to a small form to the different organs coming to the flower coming out to the seed and the plant dying and becoming going back into the soil so he tried to imagine that journey and he, he, he wouldn't try to, to reduce back to where did this journey begin but he tried to go forward into what is what is the meaning that this plant is trying to express as if the, the reason for its journey was not um, because it was just following physical law but that the plant the flower the identity the quality of the, of the plant as a whole is what creates the journey so, so the journey comes out of where it's heading to it comes out of the future in a way and and for Goethe there's just one gesture you don't break that down into small bits, you don't kill that process. But with your imagination you try and enter that process as a whole. So what is the journey that um, that possibility goes on in that particular context in order to express this meaning? So, so would you say this is a rather than cutting the flower open and looking at the little bits and understanding it in a kind of reductionist way, it, the, the way you're describing of the flower growing and how that relates to the whole is that is that what we call holism? Is that is, is, that, yeah, is that a holistic science? Yeah. yeah. So, so holism has different um, uh, you know disciplines through which it's been studied, like complexity theory, um, which looks at relationships and how these how a whole can emerge from the dynamic of relationships. So if you try and understand an organization by, you know, which you learn, might learn at business school by breaking it down into, okay, we want to do this and this person's going to do this and that person's going to do that. Then it completely rules out that this person doesn't like this person and they're not going to work well together. And uh, that you, you, you you know, they've got a culture in this land where they're in of not working very hard anyway. So maybe it's the wrong place. So instead of trying to um, break things down into isolated parts, complexity is saying, oh, what is the dynamic of relationship? And if a relationship is good, then it can have emergent qualities that are neither coming from you or from me, but are coming from the relationship of the two together. And so um, that's another way of looking at holism, that y you cannot, in that way that reductionism has of breaking things down into isolated parts, you're actually missing some of the qualities that that whole system is going to have. And Goethean science takes that a bit further because it says uh, it's not only um, the relationships uh, that have got to be kept whole to understand the whole system, but actually it's the, the movement, the gesture of the plant as a whole, that if you if you dissect that into different stages, which would, you'd find in any biological textbook, you've actually lost uh, um, that, that unity of the process as a whole. So, um, okay, we're talking talking about holism and holistic ideas here, but I think a lot of people have heard the word holistic, yeah. but it's, it's a very vague concept for a lot of people, yeah. and, it, and most people probably don't have a very solid idea of really what that means. Yeah. So, so I, I, I know you're 
a what was it, holistic science teacher. That's, yeah. that's one of the things you've been lecturing on, and um, you, you run the holistic science journal. Right? Yeah. And um, so, so I think there's probably no one better in the world to ask than you. Yeah. So you know, what, what exactly is holism? What's the, what, what does it mean? What, what's the definition we're working with? Yeah. You know, how do we explain yeah, it? Yeah, it's a good question because often holism is taken as, oh, you don't worry about the parts; you look at the whole. Uh, but that's not what holistic science uh, is about, or Gertian science, or complexity, really. What you're interested in holism is lo actually looking at the relationships between the whole and the part. So there's a kind of paradox that the whole comes from the parts. You can't understand the whole message of a book unless you read each word. You can't say, well, I'm going to understand the book, I'm not going to bother with the parts, I'm not going to read the words. You, you have to actually um, go through the parts uh, to reach the whole. And yet at the same time, th the parts would not be there. They'd not be, um, you, you would not use those parts unless they were able to express the whole in some way. So, so there's a kind of circle here that you have to go through the parts to get to the whole but what are the parts? They're expressions of the whole. And so you have to kind of suspend judgment. Like when you're reading, if you tried to isolate each part, which would like be a reductionist way of, of analyzing a book, and say, okay, this first word, the, uh, it comes from Anglo-Saxon, and it can mean this, uh, that would be, a, you wouldn't actually understand the meaning of the book. But also if you just, flip through the whole book in five minutes, it wouldn't mean you'd understood the whole book either. You, it's called the hermeneutic circle, that you have to um, suspend judgment. You have to go into the parts, into the words, or into the flower if you're looking at it, but you're allowing that the whole that actually uh, shapes or calls forth those parts in, into expressing this meaning are only there because they give expression to this whole, this quality. And so that's that thing also, having a whole process, that you, you can't separate that out and say, okay, this plant type has this type of parts and these connect together in this way. So, so it seems what you're saying is that uh, holistic uh, philosophy and holistic science is not not necessarily in opposition or an alternative to reductionist science is actually a necessary supplement that's been missing from today's scientific philosophy. Is that is that what you're getting? Yeah, at? and and you know very simple to to expand it into that uh, you know into that different focus into that different dimension that things have. So so you, you've you've been working at Schumacher College. Um, yeah, which is is it? Would you call it a holistic university? Is that is that what it is? I mean, more or less. Or what what is it exactly? Um, well, it, it's a, a a place that began um, uh, with an aspiration to provide a different type of education, and uh, holistic science came to the college because it was understood that you can't teach wholeness in a conventional educational setting. You, you have to have a different um, uh, address of life where you, you take time, uh, you, you cook together, you allow things to, to be in their own uh, order, their own existence, their own quality. So it's not about filling your mind with knowledge about something. It's rather how do you address the world, and the world has this quality of that it, this isn't like a philosophy of how you can think differently. It's more being able to see how things are, and that things have this quality, that the whole and the part uh, speak themselves into being together. So, so, so so it's it's it, so the idea was to bring that to the college where you you're surrounded by nature you, you've got space you've got time so so your role there has been to teach holistic science now i uh, i think i certainly and i think most people probably don't really have a good idea of what that is or what that looks like i mean 
So, you know, when I went to school, my science studies, I did some physics and biology and chemistry. We'd, you know, look at how atoms work and all that mm. kind of stuff. I mean, w w what is holistic science? What are you actually teaching? What, how, what does that look like as a student, yeah. for example? Well, so, so when you go to school and you learn about how things work, um, it's really important to to uh, appreciate that that is one way of engaging with the world, and it's a you know it's a, it's obviously a very rigorous and uh, fair way of engaging with the world that you start from yeah the question what is the material center of something you work out its mechanism you work out how it works and you can employ that to yeah in a million things to generate energy or run trains or have mobile phone technology but um what's lacking in that is that uh, so in that way of seeing you're starting from a center you understand and kind of working outward into applications but holistic science is rather trying to do the opposite thing which is you start uh, with, with a periphery of potential and w what you're asking is how does that periphery of potential assemble itself into an identity that has meaning as a whole and so if it does not have that meaning, it won't hold together. Uh, and really, holistic science is, is, is kind of turning the mirror the other way round. That in, instead of asking the question, how can we understand and use this from the inside out? You can say, how does this assemble into a meaning from the outside in? And that meaning, uh, it it it's not so much how things works, it kind of collects things together, it gathers qualities together into an identity uh, that's able to exist at a higher level of things. And so when we come to the problems of the world at the moment, there's tons of things that work, but they don't hang together. You know, almost laughably, uh, the, the, the actual pro, the actual goal is not achieved, even though you've got a hundred clever things on the way, which are supposed to, you know, move that on. So the idea that somehow we've lost sight of the whole, uh, um, and that there are tools, you know, very simple tools that um, let you work with that, and that it's not, uh, it, it's not. Um, getting rid of science, going from the centre to the application. But it's saying, if you're going to make that movement, you also need to be aware of the other movement. So, so, you know, I was talking to Satish, uh, who, who you work with, right? He yeah. also lectures there? Yeah. yeah. So, um, so we were talking about just the, the, the modern education, the way it works, and how... It seems to have derived from a, I think, 17th century, you know, industrialist philosophy, mm, yeah. um, where kids are, you know, grouped by date of manufacture, not how well they work in mm. groups, for example. Yeah. Um, and and you know, the, we know all, we all know how the uh, modern education system works, but it's, it seems to be you know, deeply unhealthy. Mm. So so, I gather you guys are trying to to work to create a healthier alternative to mainstream education. Mm. So, so how's that working out? Has has it has it has has there been positive change come through uh, what you guys have been doing? Have you seen any students like uh, you know work, go on to change the world in some way? I mean, mm. ha has it has it been an effective way of making things better? Yeah, I mean, the the weird thing is that y you'd have thought that a lot of people would have taken notice because the college has been going twenty seven years. And uh, it's had a number of master's courses, not just holistic science, it's had short courses. It's had something like 20,000 people passing through it. And, uh, you know, it's a very simple model where people learn as much by living together, eating together as the lectures. But, uh, so f the first thing is it's very strange that there hasn't really been a dialogue um, to say, OK, what has the college learned in relation to what, how mainstream teaches? Is there a way of 
uh, finding a middle ground that could l learn some of the lessons from the college. And um, it in in and it's like that instead of um, mainstream education having moved towards the college and uh, have have accepted the importance of the human being uh, as an instrument to learn more than the computer or the blackboard or the, the, the textbook. It, it's kind of been that education uh, has retreated, uh, you know, into this even more didactic and, you know, trusting in knowledge and exams and moved away from the individual. And so it seems for me, what was important teaching was how you give individuals that confidence to uh, to be able to see the culture as a whole process. So, okay, we went into that industrialization, you know, we got completely carried away with that and made it a sort of blueprint for everything, as if there was nothing else. And we've we are now reached this crisis. But instead of um, trying to, to, to sort of dismember that into and find the problem of what happened, it's to give people the confidence to address that in themselves and to say, right, what can I do that, um, that, that touches that, you know, that, that urge, that passion in myself that wants to, that believes, that wants to see whole value, that cares about the world with this um, completely paradoxical systemic uh, situation that we've created. And so for me, the, um, the, the success stories of the people who come to the college and who find a way of being in themselves that, that they can then follow, that sustains them once they leave. And it should not be a sort of utopic wholeness that immediately you leave sort of falls at the first hurdle. It should rather be a kind of, of generative um, self-reliance that uh, it, uh, not mattering what you do, you're able to uh, yeah, be a, a vehicle for something different to enter into the world. Well, that's fantastic that, that you're equipping people with a, a tool to get through life because life is very difficult. And I think modern education simply does not do that. Yeah. So, so and, and, you know, the fact that you're teaching these people, uh, you know, a holistic perspective and a holistic way of thinking is, is obviously going to help them through their lives. But um, at the moment, those people are still in the minority. You know, in the meantime, we live in a, in a distinctly uh, non-holistic society. And, um, you know, we're raised through the modern education system um, to just accept the reductionist philosophy as as the only one truth, um, and 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 I think when we when we have that, we're granted this sort of um, psychic alienation from from the natural world, and you know we we learn to see ourselves as separate from it, like we're on it rather than that we're in it or or part of it, and 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 so we you know with comes with that we we also start to see the world as a kind of inanimate machine. Which is just here for us to exploit, mm. and for no other purpose than our own, own, own exploitative benefit. So, so as things are going, things don't look good for humans. It, it, you know, extinction is a distinct possibility right mm. now. So, so for people who aren't fortunate enough to be able to go to Schumacher College, for example, mm. or, or places like it, you know, how how do we get this? holistic perspective back and prevent our own extinction do it you know do we need to become neo-luddites and give up technology and avoid avoid uh, destroying the world how, how do we how do we mm. you know save save ourselves from here yeah, yeah but um to me uh, and you know i think it's a vital question how do we t take it beyond just one place that nobody can come to uh, so for me it goes back to this question of meanness and openness this quality of meanness and openness plays out in many different places. Uh, you know, if you see a fairy tale like we did last night, it runs through the whole thing. And you can see it in our politics uh, that um, we've, we've, we've kind of, uh, as a society, we've, we've, um, we've kind of uh, endorsed this meanness 
we said it's okay, like Margaret Thatcher saying, there's no such thing as society, there's just the individual. And it's like it's okay to be, uh, to be mean and um, disbelieving and not thinking about climate change and not caring. And th it's that that needs to be brought back into perspective, that that meanness is not, uh, you don't have a license to be mean. We, we can see that in the world, even if our culture says it's okay. And th th but there's always this two sides of the coin. There's also this pole of openness, where we don't uh, kind of um, try to to judge. We surrender to um, to try to meet the quality of where we are, and. Um, we allow, we're generous to the world, we're generous to each other, we're generous if we're in nature, we're generous to uh, the opportunities there are in the world at the moment and how we can help them. And uh, and we, we, we've kind of lost sight of that, uh, that, 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 of that openness. Um, in in order to create something together that has integrity, that has meaning, uh, that gives direction to people. And so it's restoring that balance, where of course sometimes that you have to have that meanness, you have to, you know, n not be open and generous to everything and everybody. You have to l limit something into a local form. But uh, it, it f for me where we are is kind of asking this question of us, of each of us. You know, are we open uh, or are we mean? Are we, have we understood the meanness others have done to us? Uh, and can we be open in response? Can we uh, f find our destiny? You know, what is it that's inside us to do? And uh, I'm optimistic that. That, that everybody can do that work. You don't have to come to Schumacher College or study. It's, it's something that a lot of people are doing at the moment, that instead of looking out there for somebody to solve our problems, it's, it's understanding that that balance of the world is in each of us. And so each of us can kind of make that, that equation, that, uh, that weighing of these two sides. And say, okay, what do I, what do I want to do at the moment? Do I want to be mean, more mean, or is this a time to be open and to go beyond that meanness, to go beyond that anger that this has happened and that has happened and that has happened, and to say, oh, I, I believe in something in the world. So th this uh, this meanness that that that. that seems to be around in the world and uh, you're encouraging a change here which is great and trying to get mm. people to think in a, in, a, in, a, in a more generous and open way this is great but um this this meanness is you know pervasive at the moment uh, and i wonder whether it's linked to the kind of reductionist philosophy um in in some way the idea that you know, we're all separate individuals rather than, uh, for example, Satish was talking about how um, with the holistic philosophy, if you if you think of chopping a tree, you also have to think you're chopping your, off your own arm because every time you chop down that tree, it does affect you and it affects everyone and everyone else. And this, this when we when we see ourselves as so separate, um, we can we can hurt the world around us without assuming that we're also getting hurt or that we're hurting, we're hurting those we love. Um, so you know, I I wonder whether whether this reductionist philosophy is perhaps the the cause of some of the meanness that you talk about. What what, what do you think? Uh, well, I think originally reductionism uh, it was a verb that it was possible to separate something from the world. Uh, so Maxwell said that you know the way to study something is to isolate it from everything around it. So if you want to study the tree. Uh, yeah, you have to isolate it. You can't see it as your arm. If you want to uh, do an analysis uh, for for an encyclopedia article of what that tree is, 
the whole point of science is to separate. But as long as you see it as a verb, that it's something that we do, that separating, then it's, it's yeah, it's balanced. There's a complementary that putting together is also a verb and that you, you have to have both those verbs, otherwise the world becomes uh, like a Tower of Babel, that it's incomprehensible. And so, uh, the, the, I mean, to reduce is, is fine, because that's how our brain works too. Our brain has to think of a, the tree as something separate to one's arm. That's how we think. But uh, reductionism as, as a kind of... Um, that, that, that becomes made into something that's taught, that's taught as if it's the cultural norm, and it's made to apply to everything. That uh, if, you, if you don't fit in a box at the moment, you're liable uh, to be arrested. I mean, almost literally. That the, the whole health and safety, the whole classification of things is, is to, to actually um, work with a world that's completely separated, that's completely reduced, not as, as a uh, way of understanding the world, as a verb to reduce, but as something that's taken completely literally, that the world actually, its only existence is in that categorized and reduced state, and that the only way for it to work is by putting everything into some box or other. So, so it's not that we can point the finger at the reductionist philosophy as being the problem, it's the reductionist philosophy without its complementary holistic philosophy that's the problem. It's, yeah. it's the reductionist philosophy alone, yeah. um, you know, in isolation that's the problem. Yeah. So, so right now, uh, you know, we, we live in this world where the, the reductionist philosophy alone is the, the main way of, uh, the prominent way of thinking. You know, people don't really consider holistic attitudes mm. alongside the the reductionist side so so it's like we're walking on one leg and, and 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 you know while we're doing that we've we've gone off you know maybe in the past few hundred years it seems to to gone off track completely and we're we're just absolutely destroying the planet and and you know our own life support systems we're just wrecking it and meanwhile you, we've got these indigenous societies you know the last of them who don't share this same way of thinking. They think mm. much more holistically, I gather at least. Yeah. And uh, they've been living sustainably for thousands of years. And, and now the last of them are pleading with us, you know, please don't destroy what mm. little is left. And uh, so, so something is clearly wrong with the way people are thinking. So, so I, I gather it seems that it's the lack of holistic thinking being integrated with reductionist thinking. So, so w when did this happen and why did it happen? Like, what, what, wh why, why, and when did we adopt this only kind of reductionist view set? Was this what was it, Descartes, or you know, wh wh when did this mm. happen? And wh why did it happen? And you know, how is it different before then, perhaps? Yeah. So, uh, you know, the the the, the focus on. Um, you know, after what happened really was there was a Protest, you know, there was the story of Catholicism, uh, which was a single story, and then Pro Protestantism came along in the West, and uh, suddenly you had many stories, and then there was the Thirty Years' War, and uh, the, the the whole idea of having the Spirit or God as a kind of uh, a leading um, uh, a, a leading f figure of of how to live in the world, kind of um, yeah, you could say we at that point we were in the opposite state of of trusting too much in a holistic view, uh, with with no kind of um, breaks or or um, or or. Uh, resistance to who, whoever was in power in that way. And what's incredible, though, is that uh, the, the scientific revolution happened in an incredible short time. That, 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 that change of ideas from believing in the priest or God 
uh, unquestionably to to the idea that science could um, provide a an understanding that that was everybody's about how the world worked, and that uh, it did not require a priesthood. It, it anybody could do the experiments. Rationality became a kind of uh, a whole body of knowledge that could have courts, it could have experiments, it could look into the nature of things. And it was within about 30 years, around the time of Newton, and at the end of the Thirty Years' War, where the Catholics and the Protestants in Europe had spent you know, battle after battle in this pointless you know who who was representing the true god and uh so there is something very hopeful in that that change can happen really quickly when a culture gets satiated with a particular way of being and uh and you can say that um that up till around 1850 uh science developed um quite kind of openly you know that there was no big industry it was mainly rich people who were doing it uh that there was a dialogue like goethe was able to practice science not being part of the academia and challenge science i think though uh that around 1850 especially when darwinism the origin of species and uh, Maxwell invented electromagnetism uh, so that brought in mobile phones the steam engine came and then at that point uh, th that whole way of in in intellectualization started uh, being kind of uh, allied to a whole system of industrialization and with power and money at stake and so it became much more um it it became much more something that uh it it became a sort of philosophy in itself this way of thinking instead of just a way to act and uh if if you look how that went further with like with the atom bomb in the 1920s where it, it ended up that our intellectualization could destroy the world, uh, and we, you know, we started analyzing, psychoanalyzing people, and everything became intellectual. So uh, it we it's sort of been like an onion that we've been going into this thing, and we've now reached this kind of yeah, the nucleus you could say, where nothing works, despite that huge effort. We've got to a place of complete uh, inner um, incomprehensibility, and yeah, and really like a breakdown that you know we can't even talk properly to each other without some concept, you know, ending up bringing a split, a divide between people. So uh, we can't kind of solve that what's happened. You know, we can't say, oh, let's do this to education, it'll be all right. Let's start a school here, it'll be all right. It's rather we've got to accept that we've been on this journey. And, yeah, we've we've pushed something right to the limit of saying, okay, there's no God, meanness is fine. Uh, we, we can just survive on our own intelligence. Well... Your book, uh, Time, Light, and the Dice of Creation, yeah. um, it, it goes into uh, quite a lot of detail about this uh, kind of fascinating, mind-boggling world of quantum physics. Yeah. And I think quantum physics is another one of those things that most people only have a very vague understanding of and don't yeah. really understand. I mean, you know, I've heard the terms, but but I don't really understand them. You know, terms like uh, quantum entanglement mm. and the double-split experiments. Yeah. Um, now, you know, th these are fascinating things, but... Uh, I've even tried to research them and I still don't really understand them. But but you you do seem to understand these things a lot better than most people. So so can you kind of explain them in a way that we can understand? Like what what is this quantum entanglement and the double split experiment? And, yeah. You know, what, what's going on with all this stuff? 
um, well, the double slit experiment uh, is that you have a particle and you have um, two slits. So you have um, a slit here and a slit here. And this is covered in the middle. And so the particle can go through two slits. And so um, normally if, if, if you cover one of the slits, you'd expect the particle to go through one slit or the other. So it, it would go through the slit, and because the slit has a certain breadth, it will appear on the screen behind it uh, over a very small band. So if you cover one slit, it, it appears here. If you cover the other slit, it appears here. So you think that if you had both slits open, that, that you, you would get a band here and a band here, and nothing in between. But actually, if you have both slits open, you get a completely different result over many experiments, that you get a sort of interference pattern where the most ways that the particle goes through the slit is at the centre. It's not through directly through one slit or it's directly through another. And some particles um, then go to the side of that and a small number then go further out. So you get a completely different result if both slits are open than if you add what happens if one slit is open and the other slit is open. What is more remarkable is if you now look at one slit, so you look through which slit the particle is going through, that will change the result of the experiment. And you'll go back to having a band here and a band here of where the particle hits the screen. So how you observe, where you measure the system, actually changes the result of the system. So this completely overturns that whole Newtonian idea that reductionism is able to give you a picture of the world independent of the observer. So, I mean, th this is mind-boggling. Uh, why, why does that happen? Do we, do, we, do we have an idea of why looking at the slit to see which you know, uh, hole it goes through, uh, how that changes the pattern when it hits the wall? I mean... Uh, do we know why this happens? Is it, is it a mystery to us at the moment? Yeah, yeah it's a complete mystery. <laughs> and you can't, um, you, you, you can't, you have to bring in uh, an, something about measurement, but you can't, it's not a sort of fabrication because we haven't understood enough to get what really is going on. But to give uh, an example of Henry Bortoft, uh, who worked with David Bohm and who provided a holistic interpretation of this that um, he, he, he would have said that the world is, is not um, reductionist you can't just take it apart and that there's an objective world out there which you've explained once you've taken it apart somehow there's something else happening where um, the way we interact with the world, with the meaning we make with the world, has something to do with how the world is constituted. You can't separate out an objective world and put the observer um, somewhere else and say, let's reduce this world into its parts and then we'll see how it works. Instead, you have to say um, that... Uh, that, that when you observe something, in a sense, you're bringing it into being. And that uh, you can bring things into being in different ways. And so this goes back to what we were saying about you can bring the world into being in a mean way or an open way. That there is no world out there that's already formed. It's how you relate to the world helps create the the... The, the world that you live in through the choice you've made. This is a, this is a um, difficult kind of, uh, what's the word, um, intangible concept. Uh, it's, it's quite difficult mm. to get my head around this. So, so you're saying there's no actual, or, or we don't actually perceive the, the objective world. There is no objective world. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a world that we're creating in our own heads. I mean, what, what, what do you mean? you're talking about this yeah so um so so the assumption of reductionism is that um th that there's a world out there and uh that that 
we, we interact with that world and we can explain what that world is by science and experiment. Uh, but there's an assumption in there uh, that um, that you know that this world out there exists, and that assumption is what quantum theory brings into question, because according to how you interact as the observer with the system, you, the, the the system behaves differently. So you need some other way of um, you need some other context in which the world is behaving uh, that that um, is more that is more than just the material parts of it. So something is happening. There's a, there's some kind of connection between the observer and the apparatus of the slits and the particle that is more than just the particle, the slits, and the uh, screen on which you're measuring it. And so, yeah, one thing you're not looking at is holism. You're not looking at the idea of um, uh, what is that context of meaning in which all these different things relate, the particle, the slits, the observer. And so when you bring in this context of meaning, then um, and you say that it's actually you need a context of meaning for something to exist, and so, th and and so what the, the experiment is showing is that is is in a way the particle and the slits and the observer finding that context of meaning, in which th th they coexist, and having found that context of meaning, only then. Is there an objective world which you can talk about? The particle as something separate, the slits as something separate, the screen as something separate. I see. So, this 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 philosophy of taking in holism into account is uh, is is not normal. Unfortunately, most people don't think that way. Yeah. Um, so, so you know, right now we we generally in in a society share this uh, kind of. Um, reductionist worldview only we only have we'll take that perspective and and I, I'd really like to see humans uh, human society kind of uh, upgrade that or move on from it or, or, or reincorporate holism in some way because this current philosophy that has you know just the universe as a machine and there's nothing animate in it and there's nothing mm. connected seems not only to be you know just flawed and wrong but it's also seems to be what permits us just to, to just do this wholesale destruction of, of the world. Mm. So, um, you know, th this 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 reductionist model is is founded on the on the belief, though, that, that we live in this um, kind of mechanical universe that exists according to to you know realizable and inviolable laws. But you know, quantum physics seems to show that that's not actually how the universe works. It, it, mm. There's something else going on. The, the mechanical worldview doesn't seem to hold up in the face of quantum physics, right? And yet, orthodox science still holds just the reductionist worldview, largely. Mm. So, so why, why, haven't, why hasn't science kind of changed to, to adopt uh, holism to explain this, this uh, yeah. you know, quantum physics? How, how, can, how can scientists say the world is, is this, uh, you know, uh, mechanical place while also knowing that quantum physics exists, mm. you know, how, how, why is why is it like that? What's what's going on? Well, there's a really uh, tale which is in my book about um, so when Bohr and Heisenberg and other physicists kind of tried to come to struggle with what what is the meaning of quantum physics, and they went through years because they were schooled in a mechanical way, and they just could not come to terms. Uh, with, with results like the double slit experiment, and uh, it took uh, until the 1925 and 26 to realise that you couldn't talk anymore of a world uh, out there. That physics was about understanding the world. You had to talk about physics was about ask the questions you could ask of the world and the type of answers the world gave back, which was a huge shift. And but in order to dress this up 
into something that was acceptable. They introduced this idea of measurement as a philosophical uh, sort of um, cloak in which to dress up the theory. And because when you actually measure something, these mysterious effects kind of collapse because you're actually seeing something, you're forcing something into existence, you're imposing a meaning uh, at which the weirdness dis dissipates. Uh, by bringing measurement in, it was a way of getting back to something that was at least vaguely tangible in physical terms, that it had to do with isolated particles and isolated existences. And um, after they'd come to this understanding in the 1920s, they, uh, in the 1930s, they understood they were investigating the, the atom and the nucleus, and they realized that there was a particle called the neutron, which was neutral in the nucleus. And in 1938, just as the Second World War was starting, they realized that you could actually, um, by, um, by hitting an atom with a neutron traveling at high speed, you could split a, nu a, a nucleus in two, into two different elements. And, if, and there were certain elements which, by complete chance, apparently, seemed to allow this to happen. And not only when you split one nucleus apart, a neutron would come out, or two neutrons would come out, which could then split two more nucleuses, which, and then produce four neutrons, which could then split eight. And so, right at the beginning of the war, when that whole meanness of spirit was, in, was opening up this conflict, in man's hands was this, he realized he had this weapon. And so it was very analogous to what was happening politically, that he could, he, 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 he knew how to destroy the world at the very time in which his hatred was creating this, this, this very context in which such a weapon could be used. And uh, there was this incredible meeting in 1941 where Heisenberg, who was German, uh, and Germany were occupying Denmark, he went to visit Bohr in Copenhagen, who'd been his boss. And uh, Bohr, uh, was com he was Jewish, uh, so he was completely surprised why Heisenberg, in these circumstances, would come and visit him. And Heisenberg in his letter, said he was vaguely, because they were working on the German bomb, he knew Bohr was working on the Danish bomb. And th uh, they met under very recriminating circumstances. There was no common ground between them. And th it was like that the two men split from the, Jew the one holding the Jewish side of things, the Allied side of things, and Heisenberg holding the German side of things and the occupier side of things. And so it was like that whole division played out, that whole destruction that was on the table of mankind in the conversation between the two people. And because there was no wholeness, because they could not find in, that, in their theory there was no wholeness, there was no way for them to come together in a, in a humanitarian kind of step. So um, it, it's quite ch chilling and that Incredibly, the war ended August the 8th when the atom bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. And so the whole war, you can see, in, in terms of this uh, analogy of, of reductionism and losing the whole. And so, uh, and that when you, and it's amazing how uh, that, that, that there's this language kind of running through our culture that uh, it somehow speaks the greater possibility of our culture. So how the atom became this symbol for destruction and yet uh, s somehow I would say um, that within the atom you can look at it differently. You can have a holistic viewpoint of it. You can look at the atom in terms of meaning. And instead of breaking it apart and destroying that meaning, you can celebrate meaning in the atom. You can say the atom is like 
something through which meaning comes. You can turn around quantum theory to to say the universe is where the observer uh, creates the world as one with meaning in in his engagement with the world. So I'd say, yeah, both possibilities are there through quantum physics. But is that what we see in the world right now? Is modern science um, changing uh, and becoming more holistic in order to understand the entire universe, including quantum physics? Is that is that uh, are we seeing change there and 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 a return to holistic thinking or or, or no? What do you think? Well, no, well, you know, part of my work at the moment, which you asked at the beginning, is trying to say how can you, um, and it's not just mine. It's been a lot of people. How can you uh, bring the, a language of wholeness back into physics? And uh, and I would say that um, that that journey has taken huge strides. Like with Henry Bortov, Spencer Brown, who wrote a, a logic of wholeness, Basil Hailey, who applied it into modern physics. And I think there is a step to be taken that would uh, yeah, bring this double dimension to reality, the wholeness and the reductionism, back into science. It's not that science, it's like science is only seeing with one eye or only standing on one leg, but both legs or both eyes are there in the picture, especially with quantum theory. So in that sense, I'm very hopeful in one way that uh, th that w that move is, is sort of imminent. But on the other hand, um, our whole belief system has been based on reductionism. And so you can't just argue, let's get rid of our belief system in a paper. Somehow the, the whole and the, and the part have got to change at the same time, that, that our view of the world we're in and uh, the belief that governs how we behave in that world, uh, they, they've got to change simultaneously. So we accept, just like they did at the time of Newton, where in writing Principia Mathematica, he both changed the, the understanding that underpinned the culture, but at the same time, he changed the belief. Well, right now we're we're at a time that's ripe for this change, mm. and 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 it's being brought on by by uh, you know an emergency of the, among you know of the climate, and uh, you know this kind of fractured existence we have, uh, where everything's split up, has has led to has led to just uh, just a, a seeming nightmare that's coming in terms of the environment. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Exeter, and. Uh, and I saw hanging on various monuments around town and clock towers and stuff these uh, these big banners. And it was like it was like um, you know when you watch a post-apocalyptic movie, you see signs from before the movie saying like uh, you know it's time we have to change the last of days are upon us. And it was those kind of banners. They were they were put out by a group called the Extinction Rebellion, mm. and I never heard of them before. And uh, and basically they were saying, you know, time is running out. We have to change. We have to change. Mm. And uh, and you know, I like this message, the extinction rebellion, because that's really what we're facing. Mm. Uh, maybe not. Maybe not in the next decade. Could be in the next decade. It could be a hundred years. Could be two hundred years. But the way things are going, it's completely unsustainable, and 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 it has to change. So, so you know, it's clear that holistic thinking, you know. Um, bringing back ecology and economy and science and 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 theology and you know bringing these back together is, is very important it'll be a great medicine for this for this current era mm. we're in but you know even if it's adopted worldwide and everything does change and we start we start thinking um more holistically uh we might for example you know consider the ecological impact of our economic decisions we might decide not to stop chop down, chopping down the rainforest, but we still have this kind of, um, you know, the relentless operation of this exponential growth curve, not just with population growth, but with everything that comes with that. And that, that exponential growth curve, you know, acts as a kind of multiplier for every issue we face. So 
we, we're at this precipice now. We're at a, you know on the edge of an emergency, and our leaders, our political leaders, are absolutely going to do nothing to save us. They're in on the game. If anything, that they're, they're, they're bringing us closer to the edge. So, so what can we do now to you know prevent this, to change things, to prevent our own extinction as a species, to stop things collapsing? Um, you know, can we even do that? Are we even redeemable? Uh, are, are we going to make it? Um, how, how do we how do we find this way forward into a healthier future? Okay, if if it's even possible, what do you think? Yeah, no. So to go back to the work in India, that which is with very dry areas and where the water is decreasing, uh, at least in the last couple of years, then it's quite incredible when you see what happens when a community actually um, takes on board openness that they become open to the land, they become open to each other, they become open to the possibilities. And at that moment that they commit, they, they sing together, we're going to re- remove, re- return the water, we're going to put money into returning the water, we're going to help do it. And what happens then is that this huge activity happens where the community come in their tractors and start moving the earth you know after they've chosen a site to do it every day huge you know it's just this turnaround of tractors and the jcb's putting the mud into the tractors and they're building the walls and in in if you try to do that top down if you try to get some world leader to tell you uh right, we're going to build this had It could take five years and probably would never get completed. But because the villagers have decided to do it in their heart, then it takes 10 days maybe. And then they create the walls of it. Uh, they create the overflow structure. It's well thought through and it has to be durable because all this water's pouring through it. So they add bricks. But at the end of it, uh, that landscape is completely changed. There are green fields, they're growing wheat where they weren't before. And and you see this huge lake of water that w- was completely dry. All the monsoon rain would just wash away before that. And so if, if you see that, then you realise that uh, if people in their heart um, can encompass this openness in our current situation can um, uh, yeah, reach to that source in themselves then everything can change really quickly it's not that, that change has to come from outside we need a law we need to get rid of uh, economic growth we need to uh, you know somehow dismantle reductionism it's that uh, you, you, you have to get people into the feel of what an emergency is and what an emergency requires from us and that, uh, that, that what comes from our heart in our openness to, to other people and, and the landscape and what's possible at this time uh, is what the world needs and, and nothing else. And so we've got to follow that. And if we do, then things can happen incredibly quickly. Like if there's a, a disaster somewhere, that, that, that speed at which relief is made. So you're talking somewhat about this, uh, this, this kind of openness, this generous spirit. Um, what I'm interested in here is 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 a kind of a, a solid way. How do we do this? Now, I I I, I kind of gen- softly understand what you mean. Um, mm. Try and become a bit more um, giving and a bit less taking and a bit less uh, caring about my own thing and more caring about the the, the greater world, perhaps. But uh, you know, as a kind of final message to people out there, uh, how how do we how do we do this? How how, how do we become more open and more generous and more giving and, and better and uh, how, how do we really bring that into ourselves yeah so the analogy of the water is a good one how do you bring water to an arid desert so we've created this arid desert of the spirit in in our culture 
but we, we shouldn't worry, we could spend our whole time worrying about it. And so do many communities in India. The first thing is to say, okay, this has happened. The rain has stopped, the wells are dry, we've got a dry land. Uh, but the point is not to stop there. It's not to think that's an excuse not to do anything. The, the second thing is to say, um, okay, we're in this situation. How can it be a challenge? How can this um, threat or this challenge we've laid down to the spirit by the attitude we've taken, how can we still bring the spirit back into the world? How can we still make something beautiful happen? And, and so it, it's being able... Um, it's not ignoring what's happening in some idealistic way. It's taking what's happening face on and seeing the process of it, the movement of it that we've been through. And, and where are we in this movement? We're at a critical point where everything is fragmenting and we're at that point where everything's going to crash or something beautiful and whole is going to be created that can be a vessel for the spirit, just like in the desert you build a vessel for the water. And so uh, I think um, that in the end that is the movement we're going to make because we can't make any other movement. We're going to make it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Philip. Mm. <laughs> Thank you very much.